Hey everybody, I'm Hugh Brown, Center for Three Blind Men and an Elephant, and today I'm going to spend entirely too little time reviewing a camera that deserves much more time than I have. Given that Claudia and I are leaving for Europe in a couple of days and coming on top of the Nikon Z Canon EOS R Fujifilm X-T3 announcements, we are suffering from stack overflow, rainwater barrel overflow, catastrophic climate change in suburban Philadelphia, pick your metaphor or harsh reality, glub, glub, glub. That's us right now. Sorry. But I am talking about Fujifilm's X-H1 and their XF line of dedicated APS-C coverage lenses. The good news is I can make it relatively short because with all of these announcements, the XH1's place in the firmament is clear to me now. But before I do the usual housekeeping, first, wow, Claudia and I are blown away that so many of you have signed up for the photo walk in October. We are at capacity. The list is filled. And with that, I learned that there's such a thing as a waiting list. So if any of you are signed up but can't make it, please, Go to the website and remove your name so that others can take your place. Really appreciate it. Thank you, guys. Uh, next. Yeah, if you like what you see here today, please give a thumbs up, subscribe, join the conversation below, and please support what we do by using our affiliate links down below. Since a number of you have been asking, yes, you can buy Hold That Thought t-shirts. You'll find them at our merchandise store at 3bmep.threadless.com. Finally, if you really, really dig what we're doing and want to support our work in a consistent way, please join us at patreon.com slash Hugh Brownstone. Yes, details down below and at the end of this video too. So on with the X-H1. Bottom line. The X-H1 is outstanding. Incredible imagery, especially for stills. Incredible shutter and release. Incredible body, save for secondary controls. Not that they're bad, but hold that thought. And unfortunate decisions on port configuration and recording limit requiring, yet not quite solved by the booster grip. Hold that thought. For me, the X-H1 is a total package one generation away from being spectacular one generation away, along with its phase detection autofocus, from making me seriously consider switching from our GH5. One generation away from making me seriously consider not adding a Sony full-frame body to our kit. Now, we already own a couple of their full-frame lenses that we use on our A6300. And at that point, probably the last camera someone like me would buy for many, many years differently. There truly is a case to be made that the APS-C is the sweet spot for price and performance, more than full frame or micro four thirds, and Fujifilm is making it. 
The X-H1 significantly ups the argument with Fuji's next generation body while using the X-T2's sensor. The X-T3 significantly ups the argument with Fuji's next generation sensor while using the X-T2's body. When their latest sensor finds its way into their latest body, call it the X-H2, and Fuji finally lifts the 30 minute recording limit, heck, even if it doesn't, it will suddenly become much, much harder to justify anything else. So let's get into it. One, just over a week ago, and I admit I hadn't really thought much about it before then, Fujifilm, with its launch of the X-T3 on top of the outstanding XF line with its complete set of high-performance Trinity zooms and beautiful, fast, all crop sensor primes I already knew from my time with the X-T2 and X-Pro2, became the best APS-C system on the planet. Those of you who have seen my other work know I've already said this. Two, yet on that very same day, the X-H1, the camera I'm filming with right now, the company's flagship, the more video-centric camera announced just seven months ago, complete with a larger, more robust body to accommodate the IBIS, which I'd say is second only to Panasonic's, a strengthened lens mount to support real cine glass like their gorgeous XK cine zooms and the new 200 millimeter f2 telephoto the 3.7 million dot evf much better suited to manual focusing than the xt2's 2.4 million dot unit the sub panel lcd which i poo pooed at first but i've now come to appreciate has now been let's just say it eclipsed by the xt3 as a video centric camera three that is if you want 10-bit 420 internal 4K recording at up to 60 frames per second, you don't need IBIS, you don't need or care about ultimate robustness because you don't intend to use heavy geared cine lenses, you want even better autofocusing, and you also want to spend $450 less than you would for the X-H1 properly fitted for video, which in this case means the purchase of that vertical power booster grip for a total of $1950 because this is what the X-H1 requires if you want a headphone jack and a full 30 minutes recording in 4K. Interesting, right? Four. But that doesn't mean the X-H1's current sensor, as I said, same as the one in the X-T2, isn't brilliant. It is. The colors and resolution are spectacular. They are spectacular. The film simulations are a joy. With a 27 by 40 inch print hanging on our wall, really straight out of camera, that is essentially grainless, noiseless, with wonderfully smooth and rich tonality, we just don't need more for what we do. We don't want any more. And what I've learned working with the X-H1 along with the XF 10 to 24, 16 to 55, and 50 to 140 2.8 zooms, again, Fuji's version of the Holy Trinity, the X-H1 is, to my surprise, something that I like in the hand even better than the X-T2, and I love that. I'll include a link to all of my Fuji reviews down in the show notes below. Yes, you, I am sure, heard it before. The build quality and that sotto voce shutter and release are gobsmackingly good and elevate the body to another level. The IBIS is excellent, a critical differentiator second, as I said before, only to the Panasonics in my view. It's the in-body image stabilization system that Justin Staley, senior product manager for Fujifilm North America, told me last week simply can't be made to fit into the smaller bodied X-T2 and X-T3. IBIS is so important, I think, that when the shutter speeds are low enough and the action is slow enough, IBIS trumps ultimate lens or sensor IQ every time. The X-H1's IBIS with the incredibly tasty, non-stabilized 16-55 to 2.8, which I'm using right now, is a brilliant combination. Six, as I said differently moments ago, the X-H1 and X-T3 leave me ever more certain there is no compelling advantage to full-frame cameras for the work we do other than 10 tenths dynamic range and high ISO noise performance. 10 tenths, not 9 tenths, as in we rarely really never need those incremental gains because we light. As Shane Herblett once told me, that's the first job of a DP. Reduce the dynamic range of a scene by lighting it properly and then making sure you expose properly, which I'm working on. Still, even at ISO 12,800, and again, I almost never shoot above that, let alone at that sensitivity, the results from the X-H1 are outstanding. 
especially when you compare it to Hollywood blockbusters of just 20 years ago, like The Rock, starring Sean Connery and Nick Cage. Uh, I'll put a link in below to a video I did showing just that back in the day when I was thinking about adding another crop sensor camera to our kit, the Panasonic GH5, which I subsequently did. 7. Note what I did not just say, that we would ever need superior lens performance. Fuji makes outstanding glass, not 100% of the time, but my sense is no less often than the big boys. Except, yeah, hold that thought too. Stack overflow, baby, stack overflow. 8. What does need to be said is that the latest full-frame mirrorless cameras from Sony, Canon, and Nikon do have better AF, even in stills, where the X-H1 is very good, excellent. We're splitting hairs at this point. We're at 10 tenths margin again. The X-H1 does not have the IAF that Sony's A7 III does, nor the X-T3, nor the certainty and consistency of Canon's dual pixel autofocus. Still, I was sufficiently surprised by how well the video AF did on the X-H1 when we used it during our brief hands-on with the Canon ESR that I mentioned this fact specifically in our preview video for the R. I did go hands-on with the X-T3, but didn't have enough time to really evaluate the AF. Uh, I don't really yet have an opinion on its upgraded autofocus in comparison to the X-H1 or the others. But yeah, if the best autofocus is critical to you, the X-H1 is not the answer. At least, not yet. And I don't know that a firmware upgrade to X-T3 is possible. 9. Still, the X-H1's phase detection autofocus video performance is definitely better than the GH5's or G9's contrast-only detection AF for video, even with Panasonic's 2.3 firmware upgrade earlier this year. Though the GH5 AF is better than it was, definitely usable for some of the things we do, including our talking head segments. Although, again, this is the X-H1. The point being that the gap has narrowed. The autofocus gap has narrowed. At one point, I would have even given the nod to Panasonic for cinematic AF when it works, even after futzing with the X-H1's custom autofocus settings. Smoother, visually better weighted. At first, I saw the X-H1 with both the 10 to 24 and 16 to 55 tending to snap into place, moving from a near subject to a far subject, even when I set the AF speed to minus five. More futzing, and I thought I was right. I went back into the menu and also reduced the tracking sensitivity to one on a zero to four scale. That's when I noticed that the lenses were stepping focus from one object to another. This felt like older generation autofocus motor technology. If that's what it was, this changes things a bit because it means new versions of the lenses are required for ultimate autofocus smoothness in video. Finally, with this said, that is, given that the X-H1's video AF is not amazingly better than the GH5's, given the X-H1's 30-minute recording limit, which is really actually 10 minutes at 4K without the optional grip, which the GH5 blows right through, limited only by how much space you have on the cards, given the GH5's superior port configuration, full-size HDMI and USB-C versus micro HDMI and USB 3 micro B, Given the GH5's marginally but noticeably better IBIS, given that while its major controls are the most intuitive of all cameras currently in the market, for me, the secondary switch gear is actually not as ideally located, sized, or tactically satisfying as those on the GH5, and the GH5's primary controls aren't bad at all. And given that the X-H1 does not have the rear flippy screen of the GH5 that we now absolutely prefer, we're not yet ready to make a switch. You may be in a very different place. So that's it really. The X-H1 is a superb camera, yet put on notice by its newer baby brother, the X-T3. Actually, it has to be acknowledged, put on notice just two weeks after it was announced in February this year by Sony's A7 III with its newer superior full-frame sensor and aggressive pricing. And not quite as compelling a hybrid for the work we do as the GH5. With this said, if you are truly a hybrid shooter but don't need to go beyond 30 minutes, as I said, we do, and don't need 10-bit recording, we don't, 
you could argue that the X-H1 is superior to the excellent workhorse Panasonic GH5. And I might agree with you, even if we prefer the flippy screen, secondary controls, touch interface, and IBIS of the GH5. The X-H1 is a marginally superior stills camera with its larger, higher resolution sensor, and definitely has a build quality the GH5 does not. If you are truly a hybrid shooter but don't need the 10 tenths advantages of what is arguably the best all-around full-frame sensor on the market when it comes to low-light performance or dynamic range, we don't, and prefer the ergonomics, build quality, and EVF of the X-H1, we do. You could argue that the X-H1 is superior to the excellent Sony a7 III. I understand. I might agree with you, again. But I think this is a slightly harder case to make, given the a7 III's unanswered IAF and generally superior AF, Sony's latest state-of-the-art, incredibly performant lenses, capable of shallower depth of field for a given aperture than the crop sensor Fuji's. I know of no Fuji AF lens that can get to the depth of field equivalent of a 1.4 on full frame, let alone 1.2, though it is reasonable to ask how often you actually need or use this. Lenses which use the latest generation AF motor technology for very smooth and quiet video shooting. The same cannot be said, for example, of one of my favorite Fuji lenses, the 56mm f1.2. But, while the two cameras are priced within 50 bucks of each other properly configured, the best Sony lenses are more expensive. If you are principally a stills shooter, the Sony a7 III is superior with its IAF and marginally superior high ISO and dynamic range. Full stop. Yet, the most fascinating comparison, to me anyway, is to the just announced first generation Canon EOS R and Nikon Z. While each has things about them which are good or interesting, worthwhile, I will say this. If you're a Canon or Nikon shooter not absolutely wedded to those systems, if you are interested in expanding into video, and if you are open to a second manual of arms, I'm not advocating switching whole cloth, and as a former full-frame Canon shooter myself, I'd recommend you take a very, very close look at the X-H1. It's got the IBIS the R doesn't, utilizes its entire 24 megapixel sensor the way the R can't, has the dual card slots that the R and Z don't, offers higher burst rates than either, has arguably the best ergos of all three, is more sorted, and has some very nifty tricks up its sleeve, including the one with which I'm most enamored, and the one those of you who are still shooters may be most delighted by, Fuji's film simulations. Really, you may be surprised. Although, there are rumors of an imminent announcement of a new APS-C from Sony. I am so fried. If you like what you've seen here today, please give a thumbs up, subscribe, join the conversation below. You guys continue to be just incredible, knowledgeable, inspiring, funny. I mean, you're a joy, truly. Follow us on Instagram and Twitter. Grab one or both of our new Hold That Thought t-shirts you wanted us to put up at our new 3bmepthreadless.com store. Support our work by using our affiliate links down below in the show notes, dropping us coffee money via our PayPal link down below in the show notes, or even better than that, we invite you to become a patron of our work over at Patreon. Link down below. We've created our Patreon page because we are stoked to bring you not only gear reviews, but with our What Were You Thinking and Good World Gone Bad series, historical educational, artistic morsels, and longer form conversations, not interviews, with world-class photographers, curators, gallery owners, keepers of the legacy, folks like Elliot Erwitt, Anya Sear, Mark Lubell, Ethelene Staley, and friends like Brian Smith, Paul Giroux, Nino Rakicevich, and more. We'd really like you to join us to deliver this kind of content regularly. Your support on Patreon will really help us ramp it up. In which case, as always, we thank you for it. 
that's it for Three Blind Men and an Elephant. I'm Hugh Brownstone. See you next time.